You're listening to season two of the Mies podcast. I'm your host, Josh Sharkey, the founder and CEO of Mies, a culinary operating system for food professionals. On the show, we're going to talk to high performers in the food business, everything from chefs to CEOs, technologists, writers, investors, and more about how they innovate and operate and how they consistently execute at a high level day after day. And I would really love it if you could drop us a five-star review anywhere that you listen to your podcast. That could be Apple, that could be Spotify, could be Google. I'm not picky. Anywhere works, but I really appreciate the support. And as always, I hope you enjoy the show. My guest today is an entrepreneur. She's an activist. She's a public speaker. She's a mediator. She's a chef. She's a hospitality professional. She's on the board of a number of amazing organizations supporting the hospitality industry and supporting women. She recently founded a company called Empath, which is solving the leadership, culture, and management problems for not just hospitality companies, but definitely has a focus on hospitality companies. She also is the co-founder of Women in Hospitality United, which supports, you guessed it, women. I I actually specifically remember when she first launched this project and organized some incredible female professionals at Haven's Kitchen here in New York City. She spent about 11 years, I think 11 or 12 years, for the Batali and Bastianich group. And she has all of these roles throughout her career at B&B Hospitality and Italy and dig in in a number of places where she's doing things that revolve around sustainability and environmental health, food safety, things like that. So I was super curious, like, what does that actually mean? And how do you sort of implement that into organizations? We met in person in New York at our office. And man, it was just such a pleasure to one, get to know Elizabeth, because it was the first time we got to meet in person and learn about her background. And most importantly, we just spent most of the time talking about what it means to be a great leader, what typically happens in restaurants that causes us to not be as great of of a leader or a leadership team as we could be, why the hospitality industry in general maybe has not had as much leadership education as we should, and why she's hopefully hoping to change that. We also talked a bit about how she ended up giving a TED Talk many years ago and what that was like, what it was like to found a company like Women in Hospitality United during a very tumultuous time. And generally just, you know, all of her experiences around building a number of really incredible organizations that are supporting the hospitality industry at large. I learned a lot. We swapped a whole bunch of books that we are most definitely going to read, which we'll share in the notes. And generally speaking, it was a really informative, educational, and just enjoyable experience. So as always, I hope that you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. So welcome back, (laughs) even though now we are officially live again. I don't know if we recorded because I screwed something up and our little recorder didn't have batteries, but anyways. We're good. And we were saying some things off air that... A lot of mea culpa is coming from you this morning. (laughs) No one should hear legally, but welcome again. (laughs) Uh, In case this didn't get recorded, I want to say one more time that, uh, like I said, I've been following your career for a while really just love everything that you've been doing. But when I heard that you were launching Empath, I was like, holy shit, I want to learn about this. And that's why you're here today, among other reasons. So can you just do the obligatory, tell everybody about your Yes. I just don't know how far back to go. Well, you might not need to go back to like Rome when you were cooking in little restaurants or La Cucina Italiana, like that kind of stuff. Did your research, yeah. But that's easy. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you went to, after that, you went to work for B&B Hospitality. Yes. Yeah. I mean, going back just a tiny bit, I was like an art history major, fell in love with food, Italian wine and culture, and ended up cooking in Italy for a little bit. And isn't that the same trajectory of Mario? <laughs> sort of. Major? Actually, I was born I was born in Jersey. He was not, but he went to Rutgers. So there's some yeah. Jersey connect there too. But I just once I found food, I was like, it doesn't matter where I go. And and you mentioned like publishing, whatever. But you know, I was at Del Posto, which was Mario, Lydia, and Joe's first sort of joint venture. And it had Mark Ladner as the executive chef, who was sort of a celebrity chef in and of his own right. And it just had a lot of eyes on it. And I was working in the kitchen and there was just so much. And at the time I spoke, my Italian was excellent. There's so much I would see like that wasn't translated well on the menu or I would, 
you know, I watched one of the sous chefs who was in charge of payroll. Somebody came up to him and was like, I forgot to clock out today. And, and he did the like obligatory, like press to the receipt thing, took a scrap piece of paper and wrote like Johnny 5 p.m. and like stuffed it in his pocket. And I was like, <laughs> that guy's never getting paid. And so I said, let me take let me take the payroll from there. Let me take the ordering from there. Let me take this menu printing and created this kitchen manager position. From there, it was the time in New York where the health department grading was becoming a thing and sustainability was becoming a bigger thing. What year was that? 2008, I want to say. Oh, wow. Yeah. I started there in 2006. So let's say by the time I was like really fully into the kitchen manager role and health department grading and, and Mark was very forward thinking and sustainability, we were composting before anybody was. And so that we did such a good job at it, of it at Del Posto. Mario was like, let's do it at Oto, Lupa, et cetera. It became a corporate position. Very cool. I remember Mario walking past my window <laughs> when I lived on Bleecker Street. Oh, yeah. Walking to, uh, yeah, I think it was at Poe at the time. Or maybe it was, no, it was, oh. ba it was Babo. Or but, Lupa, because you live near Lupa. Right? Well, yeah, everything yeah. was right around there. Lupa, yeah. Babo. So we, we know about B&B &B hospitality, and then you went from there to... Yeah, it just uh, kind of stopped. <laughs> like, that was the end. <laughs> well, you were starting to some fast casual. Right? Yes, correct. So, in, and I think one of the questions you had originally noted was like, what is environmental health? And it's sort of this made up name I use to categorize food safety, sustainability, facilities, workplace safety. Everything sort of started to fall under that umbrella. And it's almost like it's it's operations deeply, but it's almost like HR adjacent too, because you're worried about people's well, wellness, right? Whether they're going to get sick, whether they're going to fall, whether they're going to hurt, whether they're using things that are safe or not. So it became sort of a catch-all for like well-being. But And then did you carry that on to... And so, yeah, was it going into the second question that will maybe sort of add some color to mm -hmm. some of the other things that you're doing is you have these roles like throughout your career that were like, you know, the head of sustainability or yeah. food safety or environmental health. And they're all kind of, they all feel like the same theme. Did you learn what you learned at b, &B and then say, I'm going to go to other places and do similar things? Or was it people reaching out and asking you to help? A little them? bit of both. I think, you know, it was the first of its kind, kind of hybrid role. Certainly not, not the first director of food safety or not the first director of sustainability, but like putting them all together and sort of acknowledging that restaurants might want to focus on this or might want to make this part of their ethos. Dig, I think at the time, was particularly looking for someone for food safety. And I was like, I, I'm not going to do just that. I want to do X, Y, and Z. And the position just grows. Once you see it work, it just grows. Yeah. So, but yeah. they they brought you on specifically for food safety. Yeah. So was that building HACCP plans? What, what, does that, what does that mean as a role? I mean, um, you know, they were just, they were at like 18 restaurants going on 40 and they could just see that. Yeah, I think it was, wasn't quite on the heels of Chipotle, but it definitely, you know, that was in it fresh in everybody's mind. And they were like, we don't want to be that. And so they were looking to get ahead of scaling and continuing to be safe. I mean, what did you do to, <laughs> to solve that? Yeah, I mean. And maybe just for background, I think everybody probably knows Dig. It was, it was probably Dig In when you were there, yes. maybe. Really good food, actually. And so. they produce, you know, on site all the time. I, they, I think they have commissaries too, right? They just wound down the commissary like yeah. literally a month ago. But yes, they had a commissary. A lot of daily production. Yes. In, in the kitchen. What I loved about Dig was that they, they hired a bunch of really, I remember I had buddies, Chris, uh, a friend of mine, Chris, and um, maybe I just won't call it his last name. <laughs> but, you know, they when they hired him, I was like, wow, they're hiring like serious chefs to run these kitchens. Yeah. I always thought that was the, that was such a smart move that they had these these fast casual restaurants, but they were very very culinary forward. Yes, they were definitely food focused. It was very interesting. This is a little bit off topic, but this i this idea of the unicorn like can you get a chef who can run and yeah. a manager and a chef sort of in the same? Mm -hmm. And they they really tried. I actually don't know what they're doing now, but yeah, they're out there too. But there's no <laughs> there's not a lot of those. They're few and far between. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so so they hired you for food safety. What do you do to implement food safety measures outside of obviously just SOPs? Okay, so I feel very strongly, I'm I'm sort of out of the food safety game now, but only, I mean, in, in so much that you really have to stay current on like yeah. regulations and things. Some of the basic principles remain the same. I feel very strongly, particularly in New York, that there the health department has a list of 7,000 things. 2,000 of them are direct threats to public health. So my approach has always been this is something the health department is going to bang you on and it's something that's unsafe, right? And we want to protect public health. And this is something the health department is going to get you on 
it's not going to affect the public health as much. It might contribute to other things. And so you you sort of win the respect of the team by actually like picking your battles, which is hard in food safety because it's a science, but there's still a way to do it. Yeah. yeah. We did mock inspections. We did grading. We compared, you know, a little competitions and sort of, and again, when you add the sustainability and say, you know, we're going to use this soap and not this soap, it, it, it all kind of works together. It's all about habit and operations. So two sevenths of the regulations. Are, I just sense. made that number up. <laughs> but, but some some fraction mm-hmm. of them actually, of the regulatory things that are required are actually. They're conducive, them. right? If you, the, it's a, it's like a slippery slope, right? If you're doing X, then it, it could easily lead to Y. I'm by no means advocating that you don't comply with the health department. I can just hear some of my friends in the space crying. <laughs> In the same way that we're not doctors, yeah. we are not health inspectors or anything said Correct. here. It's more understanding where a line cook who's banging out, you know, 100 meals an hour is coming from and saying, this one is a is a deal breaker. You can't do that. You cannot cut raw chicken on that same salad mm-hmm. cutting board. But, you know, if you put the wet cloth under the cutting board and forget to move it, we'll survive. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, we're going to talk a bunch about empath today. And I also wanted to learn more about women in hospitality, oh, you know, yeah. because I, I just don't know a lot about it. But before we get there, so, so you much. know, you were at, at Dig, mm-hmm. you were at Combi. You were also involved with a couple organizations, Drive Change mm-hmm. and, and Oyster Sunday is not an organization, it's more of a consulting agency. Yeah. By the way, they are super sharp. I Amazing. love them. Can you talk a little about those two and how yeah. you're involved? I'm on the advisory board of Oyster Sunday. I mean, they are a consultancy. They sort of take you know, all of all of these small restaurants or hotels or anything that's out there that that might not be able to afford an in-house marketing or operations mm-hmm. or even just like some support opening. They do it all. They're like you you said it. They're like the smartest women in out there, smartest people out there. And I'm just part of the advisory team. Help, you know. What does that mean? Mostly it's meant sending them a lot of good people, either for as clients or as employees, and just being a thought partner. You know, like we're thinking of doing this, we're thinking of going this direction. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So what is like the cadence of meeting with someone like that? We started out with quarterly advisory meetings, and now it's more just one-offs, talking to the founder, talking to the team when they have something they need. Yeah. Cool. And then Drive Change, I think probably a lot of people know about that, but how, how are you involved with Drive Change? I'm on the board of Drive Change, who just won the Brooklyn, one of the Brooklyn Spark Prizes, which was very exciting. You know, working with formerly incarcerated youth, teaching them hospitality skills and, you know, reentering them into the workforce. That's awesome. And how is that different from like CCAP? CCAP is for youth. I'm not an expert on it, but I this our thing is people who have been impacted by the justice system, particularly formerly incarcerated youth. So I think we def, I'm not positive how we define it, but you know, yeah. people who might not otherwise be able to be integrated into society because their childhood has essentially been yeah robbed. I'm curious how restaurants can be more active in helping you know with organizations like Drive Change. Yeah, I mean, you can you can be a host restaurant. You can partner with them to take on graduates. You can donate. We, you know, we always need money. Show up at some of the the projects and and events that we do. There's also, I mean, obviously, I'm partial to Drive Change, but there's Emma's Torch. There's Food and Finance High School. There's Hot Bread Kitchen. A lot of people working in this sort of adjacent space of either with you know migrants or yeah. Cool. It's interesting how you found yourself in the world of so many of those things. I mean, not everybody who starts cooking <laughs> starts, you know, running or at least being on the board and advising all these different organizations yeah. that are. How did that happen? I don't know. It's like my superpower. I'm like, what is it? What, 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 if you had to define your superpower, what, what is it? I think it's good listening skills plus a lack of fear of asking the hard questions. You know, I think I wrote in my notes at one point. I think it's Glennon Doyle who says we can do hard things. I'm my new thing is like we can have hard conversations. Yeah. yeah. I mean you and I sort of just had one before this started, right? Like I'm not Yeah. I'm not afraid. Yeah. Yeah, I love hard conversations. <laughs> well, I, not everybody does. Yeah. Yeah, it's there's so much anxiety to it, you know. I have a sense that we're going to talk about that with what your new venture is. So, Empath, what is it? And why did you start it? As we've identified, I keep taking on these roles that are like people focused, but operation focused and sort of becoming this kind of um, catch all for HR adjacent type stuff, you know, feel good stuff. 
And I found in years of operations and in restaurants that people get into the field because they love food or they love service and they end up managing people because it doesn't matter if you're selling widgets or serving food or cooking food, people make the operations run. And they're often not equipped, not interested, not good at it, or just, you know, wasn't, were never taught. And so you start to see like people being forced into this work that that they weren't necessarily cut out for. And that's where a lot of the conflict or... It's so crazy how little managerial and leadership guidance we get as, especially in the kitchen, you know, and, and we're leading these huge teams yeah. with very complex operations, you know, dangerous equipment and also a lot on the line and it's an everyday thing. And it's crazy that like there's just almost no leadership no. and management training. No, it's like, I know what I liked that my last boss did and I know what I didn't like. And so those are, those are That's my it. guardrails. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like we're, you know, I think in other, in other industries, maybe I, I don't want to, I don't want to short sell, you know, what we do as, as, as leaders in the kitchen, you know, as, as, as a chef, sous chef, what have you, but we're not like researching leadership books and and things like that when we're, you know, when we're running a kitchen. We're thinking about like, what's the, you know, how, you know what's a, a new dish I can create? How do I innovate? Like, is my cook going to be there on time? The last thing on our mind, at least when I was, you know, I cooked for 20 plus years, I don't think I ever once thought like, hmm, how do I how be a I better be leader in a kitchen? Yeah. And it's not even in the zeitgeist of what we, of what Where we, did you cook? I mean, that was for most of my career. So I worked at Oceana for many years mm -hmm. and worked for Boulay and for Grey Kuntz at Cafe Grey. I trailed and at Oceana and they like put me in the corner. The newer... The, oh, the this was space. years ago. This yeah. when, I, when I worked at Oriol, I worked alternating five and six day weeks. Because, oh, yeah. Because yeah, you could yeah, do yeah. that then. What year Just, was that? 2003, 2004. Oh, yeah. I was at Oceana in 2000, 2001-ish. Mm -hmm. Then I, was, I went to John George for a, a very short stint because I got a job opportunity in Italy. So I went uh, cooking in, in Northern Italy and then I came back and worked for Floyd Cardoz at Tabla for a long oh. time and then Boulay and then Cafe Grey and then started opening my oh, I was such a diehard that I trailed on my one or two days off. Yes. Because that's what you did yeah, back then. of course. And at Oceana, they stuck me in the corner next to the guy scaling fish and gave me like a bucket of thime leaves to pick. Mm -hmm. And I was just like cut like fish scales hitting me in the side of the head and just fingers bloody with thyme. I used to go in in the mornings before my shift would start and just butcher fish because yeah. there's we, we got every kind of fish you could ever think of and you know just to learn how to butcher you know all these random yes get whole you know whole groupers and whole it was awesome yes <laughs> so a little walk down memory lane. but back to the to the point is like there's just no it just wasn't a conversation no of you know how do you become a better leader ironically that's probably one of the most important things as soon as you you stop being a, a line cook or a chef de partie or a tornado mm -hmm. and you're managing, that's one of the most important things. Yes. <laughs> and we don't learn any of that. No. And we're terrible at it. I mean, most people are not natural born. I mean, I, I make it, I differentiate between manager and leader. Which, and very different. Yes. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Being really, you know, you can be, if you're very organized and can communicate well, you can be a really good manager. Yes. Which is not the same thing as being a good leader. Correct. Right? And you, you know? can be an amazing leader and people will follow you into a burning building. And then once you get in the burning building, they're like, well, I don't know what to do. Right. So not yeah. that leaders are leading people into fire, but like, yeah, you can really yeah. inspire people, but not be able to manage them. Yeah. I don't remember who said somebody very smart said being a great leader means getting people to follow you, even if just because they're curious. <laughs> There's also a really great TED talk. It's only like five or seven minutes long about really it's the first follower not the leader have you seen this no. you will love this it's it's a guy like dancing crazy at a concert at outside concert and it's and he really goes through how it's actually the first person who joins him that makes the lone crazy a leader because otherwise he's just a lone crazy dancing by himself yeah but when somebody follows him then everybody joins in i'll send it to you you'll yeah appreciate that's so interesting you ever think about it, like yeah. you can't be a leader without followers Okay, so empath. <laughs> All this to say. Yes, <laughs> just constantly seeing people not equipped or uninterested or unable to manage. And also over and over again, really well-intentioned founders who would project their intention and then look at what was actually happening on the front lines or in the field. And and the intention wasn't landing. It wasn't. They weren't having the impact that the intention was supposed to. Just like people were still unhappy or disgruntled or or just things weren't moving the way they wanted. And I created Empath to sort of bridge that gap. How do you do that? 
you know, in a lot of different ways. And it's it has a couple of different components. And I'm not sure exactly which ones are going to be the ones that stick. I don't work only in hospitality, but it is my baby. And I think it's where we, it's needed the most. But it has to do, you know, some of the things I do are culture audits. So you see a lot of like engagement surveys where people like click the numbers. I do individual one-on-ones with all, for example, directors, GMs, chefs. I ask them a series of the same questions. So to remove as much bias as I can, I am a human, mm-hmm. but take notes. And then and then I put it all together and present it ideally to to more than just the CEO founder, but to a leadership team. And then together, because people... As a consultant, if you come in from the outside and say, you should do this, this, and this, people aren't bought in. But if you say, these are the sort of problems or issues I've identified, how can we solve them? And everybody has a stake in that solution. You find that people are much more engaged and the solution stick. What's the catalyst for a, a restaurant or a business to start working with Impact? You know, it depends. I feel like, truthfully, if people know me, they're like, oh, you need that thing Elizabeth does, which is not a sales pitch that I can really yeah. market. but. A lot of it has, as you know, our industry is big networking. And and so that happens sometimes. It happens also when there's a conflict, you know, an example of a CEO founder and a COO they hired. And he was like, I don't know if this is the guy. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on here. And we did a series of mediated conversations where in the end they decide, they both decided to part ways in totally amicably and and it worked out well for everyone and and that I'm sure you're going to ask questions about mediation that's the the idea is not is not to come to an agreement that necessarily everyone's happy with or yeah. or that you would think would be the thing people would be happy with it's to anyway and so from there it was like oh well I've I see that this works here can you can we have conversations here or there or whatever or what else can we uncover by yeah yeah I'm curious if you you know I don't know how many of those scenarios you've been in where there's a, a founder and a, a COO mm. or something or a chief of staff or something. And the founder's like, I'm not sure if this is the right person. Are there examples of when they are proven wrong? Like, no, this is the right person. I don't have enough experience actually mediating those conversations. I would say this was a very forward thinking founder who was like, I could be wrong. My sense is that maybe this isn't working, but I don't know. And so it was open to that. I would hope so. You know, the thing about mediation is you come to the table, you just have to come in good faith, right? Like, I do a lot of community mediation, which is like for free people. There's a, things called alternative dispute resolution centers in, in each borough. And anybody can call and say, my upstairs neighbor tap dances every night and the board won't do anything about it. Can you mediate this conversation? And as long as both people will come to the table. What? Yeah, I'm that not exists? joking. Oh, I am not even <laughs> joking. I have... I've mediated conversations where it's a landlord and like a 20 year old woman who just like can't wants her security deposit back. And like they're disagreeing on whether she should get it or not. And the landlord shows up and says, I have a lease. I don't know why I'm here, but you are here, which means which tells me you came in good faith. You're like you showed up. And by the end, the guy's like, well, I have a signed lease. I have a signed lease. And then she tells her story and there's like some nuance to it and whatever. In the end, they split the difference. It's incredible when people hear each other, what happens. Yeah. I had a very similar with my lease in Brooklyn yeah. many, many, many years ago. I wish I had mediation. What is that called well, again? The the Alternative Dispute Resolution Center. The one that I did my training at, I highly recommend is New York Peace Institute. I can't believe that exists. I had it's no free. idea. You get former partner, like relationship partners who like are have some outstanding cat vet bills yeah, and they want to solve it amicably. And it's not, they're not sure. I'm not, this is a real thing. Yeah. They weren't sure who was actually responsible for the cat getting injured and who should pay for it. But you know, you wow. just have to, it just has to be good faith show up. Wow. Yeah. And is it subsidized by the state or the city? Or? No, it's a nonprofit. So yeah. it's actually, that's a good question. I'm not positive. That's insane. Yeah. I wish I, that's... New York Peace Institute, their, their motto is let me, let us get in the middle. Yeah, Which I, think I is love great. that. Yeah. And so how did you find out about that and start, and start, did you get involved with that? So I, another interesting fact about me is that I am a stepmom and I've been in my children's life since they were two and four, which means I've been in my partner's ex-wife's life since, for a very long time. The children are now 16 and 18. Wow. And very early on, I, she and I, to both of our credits, decided like, what's in the best interest of the children is that we get along. Yeah. We, we more than get along. We're, but my partner and his ex-wife got divorced because they don't get along and they don't, yeah. right? They don't want to be married anymore. So I found myself constantly sort of in this triangle of mediating and making, and and look, 
I love my partner, but he does some stuff sometimes where I'm like, that's not right. You know, so I really... Who doesn't? Yeah. yeah. But I I really found myself in sort of a neutral position between the two of them to the yeah. extent possible. Like, I wouldn't suggest people mediate any conflict that they that they have this kind of bias with, but... It was so obvious that this was a strong suit of mine that I I went to New York Peace Institute's basic mediation certification. Yeah. Just five days, 40 hours. Then I took their advance. Then I took divorce mediation, which is very different. And I don't recommend it's much more like, what do you have? What do you have? How can we split it? It's not like, Oof, how do you feel that about it? That doesn't sound fun. It's more fun than divorce court, right? Than getting true. lawyers involved. But it's probably um, cheaper. Yeah. I'm about to take an elder mediation, which I'm really interested in because I think, you know, a lot of the questions I get from my friends are like, my grandmother, I think she's got Alzheimer's, the, my mom and the siblings are fighting over her estate and some, one of them is being really nasty and, you know. Yeah. So, yes, it's it's a thing. Are there common threads of, I mean, we all have cognitive biases mm -hmm. and human nature is such that there are certain, you know, arguments that just innately happen. But are you, do you see any patterns that, that equate to, oh yeah, this is going to work or this is not? My job is to not, is doing, to make sure I don't see those things, right? You come, oh, really? Why? Yeah. You, I, as a mediator, you are a neutral party. You are there to facilitate the conversation. You are not there to judge, help them. They come to a conclusion, great. They don't come to a conclusion, great. They want to do more, great. They want a written agreement. They want a verbal agreement. They want to scream at each other, right? Because one of the things you see is people use foul language and, and a mediator's like, oh, can we not talk like that? It's like, that's yeah. maybe how they talk. Sounds a lot like therapy. <laughs> um, therapy, I think of as like going, which I do a lot of also, going back and sort of figuring out why you are what you are. Yeah. My job is literally to help them hear each other. Mm -hmm. And when you hear sort of me repeat it back, you hear it in someone else's voice. You've been hearing that person. This is a person who's caused you harm or conflict or pain. And now you're sort of hearing it in another voice. You're feeling validated at the same time because you're hearing your own words. Yeah. It's it's incredible. That does sound like therapy. At least the therapy. And we're in couples therapy with my wife mm -hmm. and we do individual therapy. And so much of it is like, what are the vulnerability loops that we have yes. that we can catch? And how do we find objectivity in things, you know, outside of the, you know, yeah. you know acknowledging the emotion, but still finding objectivity. And like that, I feel like that has to happen, you know, in some regard for mediation too. We try really hard to remain unbiased. I mean, yeah. there are certainly some cases that I mediated where I'm like, dude, this guy's bullying you and, you know, yeah. you should ask for more, but that's not my place. Right? What you, so what are the tactics? Are you just like asking a lot of questions to get them to the... Questions, reflection, you know, parroting, paraphrasing, reframing. So mm -hmm. you're like, that really sucked. And it's like, it sounds like, you know, you were hurt by that, right? Like yeah. really just allowing not only you to hear your own words, but the other person. Yeah. It happens in so many things. It happens in, I see it in the therapy that, in the couples therapy, and just also just the way that like my wife and I try to talk. And I'm in a CEO group and we do a similar thing. Mm -hmm with our like moderator, it's like a coach, yeah. where we listen. So someone's talking and then we would repeat back. It's like, mm -hmm. what I heard was, yes. da -da. and you're just like saying what I heard, is that right? Yes. Have you heard of cube conversations, by the way? No. Oh, I'll send you this. Like, okay. my, it's really, I wish I could remember. There's an, it's an acronym, but it's basically, you know, finding common ground, understanding, and then, you know, creating next steps. But you start with like, here's what I've, well, here's what I heard. Is yeah. that right? Is that, is that what you are? And then you're yes. like, no, it's not that. It's kind of, Correct. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. I, I remember looking on Empath's site. Mm -hmm. There's like four or five services yeah. that are all kind of like pointing towards similar things, like yes. mediation, facilitation. The only other thing I sorry I had to cut you off, when you were talking about mediation, one of the things that we do see, we don't see patterns of like things that do work, don't work. You never know what you're going to get. But what we focus on is positions and interests. And the famous story about that is like two kids are fighting over an orange, you know, and and the mom or the dad's instinct is to cut it in half. But And their position is they both want the orange. I want the orange. I want the orange. But when you do, why do you want the orange? Well, I want the juice because I'm thirsty. I want the skin because I'm I'm doing a science project, right? When you start to ask quite, you what you assume is the problem is not always yeah. the problem. And what, what they're saying is their position, I need the orange, you know, is different than what their interest is, which is actually I want the skin or I want the juice. So that's a lot of what we do is we take what the person is saying they want or need and yeah. really start to dig underneath. And do you have to steer conversations? So, I mean, I find often when there's arguments, it's because both people are talking over each other and both people want to be heard and don't feel understand. And that just, it's a vicious loop. 
So we start with uninterrupted time. So whoever brings the case, you know, to the Institute, you would start. I, you know, Emily looked at me funny and I felt bad and whatever. And, you know, okay, it sounds like Emily, you know, by the way she looked at you really upset you. Then we get Emily says, well, I wasn't even looking at him. I was, you know, whatever. Oh, it sounds Mm -hmm. like you don't understand how he feels. Whatever. This happened at my house this morning. (laughs) My daughter was like, Stone, stop looking at me. (laughs) I was like, Pearl, people can look at you. Yes. <laughs> Different. I, but I've been there. Yes, my 16-year-old is constantly saying, what? What? I'm like, I just glanced in your direction. I'm so sorry. All right. Well, I have a note here that I okay. want to ask about because I have no idea what it is. And I didn't bother to. Oh, the uh, disc assessment. Yes. Yes. Right here. What is a disc okay. assessment? Sounds like an acronym. I, wait, I want to make sure I got this right. It is. It actually is. It stands for Dominant, Influential, Steady, and Conscientious, which is the most antiquated it's not a very, like the idea of calling someone dominant is a little, um, but it's a personal assessment tool and it's used to help with teamwork, communication, productivity. I really like it because it creates a sort of impersonal language with which to discuss difference. No one personality, the DISRC is better than the other. They're just different. They're different traits. Yes. So they're based on people focus or task focus. Fast paced or slow paced. I always like to say in restaurants, I say more like reflective and active because I've yet to meet a person in restaurants who's like slow, technically yeah. slow paced. Yeah. But so what happens is you get someone who's, I, you know, you're a founder. I don't, I don't know for sure. You actually have some C qualities as far as I can tell because you seem yeah. very conscientious. You like everything to be. I'm you know, an ENTJA, I don't, if that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need that a lot of founders are D. They're task focused and fast paced. Mm-hmm. I want to get it done. Where's, you know, why are we, whatever. Yeah. So you can see in any given sort of room of people why there might be conflict. And it's not because you don't like me or whatever. It's because you are a fast-paced yes. task person and I am a slow-paced people person. Mm-hmm. People focus, I shouldn't say, because you could also be a people person. Anyway, yeah. it just allows. And then you can do all these fun heat maps that say, like, if the four of you yeah. are in a team, this is where there might be tension. Of course, like anything else, you find that some of the really polar opposites actually complement each other. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, our co-founder, Mary Lee, is like almost polar opposite to me in the Myers-Briggs. Yeah. Which was out of this. But yes, it, it I, seems similar just, to the Myers-Briggs. They're all like, a version of the same thing, yeah. right? There's the Hogan assessments. Yeah, there's just, disc, there's, yeah. Yeah, they all sort of have the same end goal, right? Yes. Character assessments of like how you think and operate and how right. does that and impact And people love people. learning about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. You know, we we just had an offsite in, in Miami, like I was telling you about. And Sarah, who's our head of CS and customer success mm-hmm. and, and and support and implementation, she's also just this amazing people person, high EQ. And she ran a Myers-Briggs exercise oh, for nice. us and just sort of, you know, broke everybody up into their categories. And it, obviously we're all on spectrums for any of these. I'm, I'm assuming with DISC, yes. it's the same thing. It's a spectrum. Yes. You're not fully one or the other. But seeing, you know, hey, you all are more like this and you think like this and you and and when you're talking to an INTJ, it's going to be the, and it's like, wow, you know what? Now I know why we get into arguments. Exactly. But but it's not personal. Yeah, exactly. The great thing about the... DISC is they also do your natural style and your adapted style. And your natural style is basically, if I if we were both to leave this room and you just, just left you here, that's sort of how you show up in the world. Mm-hmm. Your adapted style is how you show up when you feel like you need to adapt, when there's other people around. And when you take it in the work context, your adapted style is how you feel you need to show up to be successful at work. And so you can see sometimes people are just, they are what they are. And that's amazing. Sometimes they're really adapting. They're spending a lot of energy to try to be someone else to be successful at that job. Oh, that's interesting. Sometimes it works for them. And sometimes they leave the, the end of the day and they're exhausted. This show is brought to you by, you guessed it, Mies. Mies helps thousands of restaurants and food service businesses all over the world build profitable menus and scale their business successfully. If you're looking to organize your recipe IP and train your team to put out consistent product every day in less time than ever before, then Mies is just for you. And you can transform all those old Google Docs and Word Docs and PDFs and spreadsheets and Google Sheets into dynamic, actionable recipes in Mies in lightning speed. Plus, stop all that manual work of processing invoices because Mies will digitize all your purchases automatically. 
and there's a built-in database of ingredient yields, prep yields, and unit of measure conversions for every ingredient, which means you're going to get laser accurate food costs in a fraction of the time. Visit www.getmees.com. That's G-E-T-M-E-E-Z.com to learn more. And check out the show notes moving forward because we're going to be adding promotions and discount codes so that all of you lovely and brilliant Mees podcast listeners get a sweet deal on Mees. Yeah, that makes so much yeah. sense. How do you assess that? I mean, you can see it on, there's like a little wheel and it says your natural style and your adapted style. Is that just questions you're asking them to, to understand? So the assessment itself is, it's like 10, 15 minutes. It's incredible how accurate it is. And it's like four words and you have to pick which one you're most like and which one you're least like. And apparently we're most honest when we're talking about what we're less like. So I think it uses that for your natural style. And it just, it, I, I very rarely meet someone who's like, this is all wrong. Very rarely. It's pretty spot. I want to check that out. Yeah, I can send you one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I have a note here about something called trained oh, yes. circle keeper. What is that? Okay. What is a trained circle keeper? So as a disclaimer, circle keeping is, is an indigenous practice that dates way back before us. And I do not claim to be an expert, but what it... Indigenous to Native, yes. Native Americans? Yes. As a way to, to process, facilitate community conversation... It is a form of restorative justice. And if you know anything about restorative justice, the idea is here in America in particular, when someone commits a crime or harm, our approach is you and you alone are responsible for that crime. You chose to do it, you perpetrated it, and you are going to be held responsible. Restorative justice says, well, there's a lot of you know, societal and institutional and cultural factors that act on people. Mm -hmm. And it, it allows more than just the perpetrator to take a little bit of responsibility, accountability, and, and involvement in the process of justice. Circle keeping is great because it's, I mean, I, I went to a training with Kay Pranis, who's known to be like the, she's like the celebrity circle keeper. She's amazing. It's set up so that, you know, there's a talking piece and whoever has the piece is talking and you can pass, but no one else is speaking otherwise. And, and it's the circle format really allows for non-hierarchical, it facilitates, you know, deep listening. And it's pretty magical. When I did the training, I was like, I think I've joined a cult. Like, yeah. it is so transformative. How does this become representative in something that you implement into, for example, in a restaurant, you know, leadership? So interesting, my friend at the Marlowe Collective has actually been running her management meetings as circles. So it really, you know, I know there were some questions about facilitation. Also, with facilitation, you're like, you're trying your best to make sure everyone's heard and you're hurting the cats and you're you're kind of, you're trying to hit some bullet points and but also make sure that the quieter people are heard. With circle keeping, everybody gets, it, it just, the circle, the thing goes around. It goes around as many times as it needs to, but everybody has a chance to speak and you all understand that as opposed to a facilitator being like, I haven't heard from you, Emily. Do you have anything to add? So both of them have their value and, and circle keeping, I think, takes a lot, actually, you'd be surprised how quickly people open up, but it can take a lot longer. It's not as... Like, yeah. And what is an example of how it's used? I mean, in a leadership setting or a company setting, like, oh, what, what are I they just, doing? I was going to tell you, it's it's used in sentencing circles. So if someone has committed a crime, the victim of the crime, the family, the you know, every part of the community uh -huh. can be... Again, in I don't necessarily use it in hospitality. I just think it's another tool in the toolbox of like how people... If, if necessary, you know, it would be an, another step after mediation if there was more people involved, if you really needed to. Yeah. I love the premise, though. Uh, it's incredible. I, you know, it's it, it's funny. I say, and now I feel like a broken record because I say this all the time. I have this like, it's a really dumb acronym, but I, I say it to myself mm -hmm. to stay thin. And thin is essentially like everything that happens with my team, mm -hmm. for example, and it trickles down to the leaders on my team. I think um, I heard this in your Margin Edge interview. Yeah, okay. I just, I, I say it to myself all yeah. the time as well, because I still, to this day, have, have trouble abiding by it. But, you know, it's either like, if something went wrong with one of my teammates, either I didn't train them well, didn't give them the tools they need. I didn't hire them for the right role. I haven't inspired them or motivated them the right thousand way. percent. Or I haven't nurtured them the way that they need to be nurtured. And so often things go wrong and I jump right to like the, the thing that they did wrong and yes and not like hmm, I wonder how I'm implicit yes. in this and I'm always implicit so I find that a lot with founders they're really 
unable to say, how did I not set this person up for success? There's, and again, this all, again, it's not necessarily restorative justice, but it's, it, it's all the same theme, which is that person didn't do the thing I needed them to do. I don't know why. As opposed to, wow, what role did I play? And sort yeah. of, you know, yeah. that's one of the questions I ask when I do a culture audit. Do you have the tools you need, you know, to do your job? Yeah. The hardest one is the hiring one. Did you hire the wrong person for the wrong role? Because yes. it's, that's also not their fault usually. No. <laughs> you know, but there's not nearly as much you can do about it. No. Well, except learn from it, right? Do a postmortem and be like, what, what was the mistake we made? What did we miss? Yeah. Yeah. Do you help with that? Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges you've seen with a team member that needs to be let go or you need to figure out if they need to be let go? The first thing that has to happen is the person has to understand what is expected of them. So I think that's one, again, it's it's one of those miscommunications of like, the person either thinks they're doing their job or they think they're doing the thing that's expected of them. And no one's actually said, no, you're, you know, this is what I'm expecting of you. Then you hold them accountable. Once it's clear, yeah. I'm okay with you saying, you're not doing the thing that I made very clear is the thing you're supposed to do. But then of course you follow HR guidelines, yeah. you know, write them up, whatever, you know, coaching. Yeah. But there's a lot of like, sense of people being disposable well they didn't they didn't do their job like yeah. let's replace them yeah it's true and it's, it's a lot more work but it's a lot of that's what i mean though is people get into food because they want to cook and they want to serve or whatever and now they're like you're telling me i gotta coach this guy because yeah. he doesn't know what the, his expectations are yeah yeah you know i haven't been in, in a kitchen as a cook in a very long time but it was just thinking back so endemic of every single kitchen by the way of you did this wrong what the you know yeah. what the fuck and it's like wait a second where's the recipe yeah how explicit is the recipe? Did you actually you know, like check to see if this person understands how to make it and why? And do they have the skill sets before you just start yelling at yes. them? And we didn't have any of that. We were no. just like, it was wrong and make it over. And almost like a- If you didn't get it thrown at you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Almost like a pride in in like being able to say you didn't make it right. And my, Correct. you know, and it's like not realizing in aggregate of, you know, of all of us, like, Oh, well, actually, that's a reflection of us. It's not. funny you say that. I never made this connection. But one of the things I hated when I was a line cook was sous chefs who came in and just pointed out everything that was wrong. And I remember yeah. thinking, it's so easy. Anybody can come in and point out everything was wrong. Yeah. And I never made the connection that really it's like, how did I not teach you how to do this right? Where did I fail? What tool don't you have? Yeah. You know, the the easiest way to sort of to think about it is your team success is your KPI of if you're a good leader. That is a good. And if they're not successful, that's a direct reflection on you. Yes. It's funny whenever I hear leaders saying, oh, my team is overwhelmed or they screwed this up. I'm like, you know that you're actually like telling me the things that you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> you're overwhelming them or you're not moving something off their plate that needs to, be, yeah. Yeah, it's and it's there's an analogy I give to a lot of my team that haven't been in kitchens when, you know, something's going wrong and, and it's like, oh, well, you know, the team messed this up or this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're in a restaurant and you order a medium rare steak and it comes out well done, you can't just tell the customer, oh yeah, my cook isn't trained well. They screwed it up. Right. It's like, no, no, this is, yes. <laughs> this is not what you ordered. Yes. No one cares about like, you know, what's happening on the back end. Oh. It's like, this is, this is the product you yeah. have. My thing is like, when somebody fails or makes a mistake, the default is never, I guess they just suck or I guess they just don't care, Right. If we can move away from that, and that comes a lot from workplace safety accident investigation. So like, I burned myself on this sheet tray. Why? Because the sheet tray was hot and it was on the metro shelf. Why? Because we don't have enough room for cooling racks, right? That's the cause. Not because you're, a, you know, a jerk who is, that's the other thing. The cook wasn't paying attention or they were lazy. No. Usually yeah. it's a structural yeah. or other. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the five whys yes. for, for things because- they might not have been paying attention, but you still created some sort of environment Correct. where if they're not paying attention, something bad can yes. happen. And that's your job is to create yes. you know, an environment where that. Right. And your job is to get to the root cause and the root cause is not that person just sucks. Yeah. So now I'm thinking about sort of other frameworks yeah. that you might use or, or books mm. that you, I mean, I love like High Output Management by Andy Grove. It's like when I, I try to reread often. High and, Output Management? Oh, it's a great okay. book. Yeah, I'll send it to you. That's one of my one of my favorites. Andy Grove, I'll send you a link. One Minute Manager is another a re really great one. I mean, there's so many good ones, but is there any that you really like or that you recommend? Well, first of all, interesting, because I think offline before we started, you were talking about having a purpose or whatever. So one of the things that isn't quite in this, 
genre, but really is important to me is The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, which talks about yes. having a purpose and intention and, and allowing intention to be your bouncer, right? So not everybody, I think there's like this all-inclusive sort of feeling, but really how do you create spaces that are, you know, safe and mm -hmm. thoughtful? One of my favorites is Thank You for the Feedback, which talks about, you know, why m less about giving feedback and more about receiving it. I don't know if this is interesting. I find this fascinating. There's three reasons people struggle to receive feedback. Truth triggers, relationship triggers, and identity triggers. So truth is just like, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but that can is blue. No, it's like just simply not. I can't, I can't hear that feedback because it's just not true. Mm -hmm. Relationship trigger is like, you know, who are you to give me parenting advice? Your kids are a mess. Yeah. And identity trigger is like, you're telling me something that I did something that's sort of like anti-women and I identify as a feminist and I can't hear it. Yeah. And what happens is if I can say, you know what, his, his kids are a mess, but the feedback he gave me is, is actually still relevant, mm -hmm. right? Sort of decoupling those two, they both may be true, yeah. but I'm not hearing the feedback because I've blocked it out because of that. Yeah. So that's yeah. a really interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like there's, there's also a fourth, which is like deflecting because you, I, I don't know why we do it, but you know, when someone gives you a compliment, mm -hmm. you're like, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. Like that happens so often. I, I do that all the time. But like, why do it's we It's so that? funny. I have, we did this exercise in third grade where we sat at a desk and you had to turn to the person at the desk behind you and give them a compliment and they had to accept it. So mm -hmm. it was just like, your sweater is pretty. Thank you. And then you turned around, but I will never forget it because, you know, you're always, oh, this thing, I just, you know, I found it in the back of my closet, right? We just can't. It's for but some reason. that's feedback. I feel like that's, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's positive feedback. It's a compliment. Right. But like so often, for some reason, humans are really yes. like challenged with just saying thank you to, <laughs> to yeah. feedback. And it's, in, I mean, I don't think, to a certain extent, it's dismissive to the compliment giver who's like. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, exactly. You're, 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 you're dismissing them by, by doing yeah. it. There's also like, you're not listening, which is another great book. Why won't you just apologize? A lot of these are like mediation, sort of like how you hear people. And Radical Candor is also another that's one that I love. One. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great one. How often do you, do you read? Are you an avid reader? I'm a pretty avid reader. I, it's funny. You sound like you read a lot of these kind of books. I also, like I just read The Endurance, which is about Shackleton's voyage in Antarctica. Have you read that? No. Fascinating. I'm going to have to remember to ask you about these. And before that, I read Five Days at Memorial, which is a book about a New Orleans hospital during Katrina and sort of the decisions that doctors had to make as far as like, you know, you have no water, no power, no sewage. The heliport is, you know, three flights down and four flights up and you have to carry them all by hand, sometimes pumping oxygen manually how do you decide how to prior, how to triage? Yeah. Who gets to go first? And sort of decisions that were made, you know, that were the best, they thought were the best at the time and sort yeah. of the fallout from that is fascinating. You know, I love history books for that reason, yeah. just because there's so much we can learn. I mean, I, I do love like all of the, I mean, there's I have, I have yeah. hundreds of these like, you know, business or philosophy books or stoicism, but like, yes. but I read mostly like, history or historical fiction. Yes. So right you now, read those two. Yeah, I, I will. I just got done reading Isaacson's book on Elon for mm -hmm. the third time. Mm -hmm. And now I'm reading Isaacson's book on Ben Franklin, oh, okay. Franklin, which is a really, really great one. I like to reread books a lot. I do. So not. for some reason, like I re I read Siddhartha every year. Oh, oh that's a good one to reread. Yeah. And Genghis Khan, I try to read. Hmm. I think it's partly because I'm terrible at remembering things. Yeah. I get so mad that like huh. I'll read a book and like, what was the thing that the, and I have to I think that's because of phones. I think we have no short term memory anymore. But yeah, I, I actually, there's a, this, well, actually, I don't have her on the, on the show. I think this woman who teaches, she actually teaches the LSATs how to take the LSATs. Mm -hmm. But really, what she's teaching is how to remember things. Yeah. And so much of the art of memory and learning is not like actually memorizing, but the state of our brain at that time. Yeah. So like the intonation of how we say something and the energy that we have when we're saying it. Yeah. And so I'm trying to like deploy that into, into, into reading now. So I'll like hmm. read uh, a paragraph or a, a, a chapter and then recite back what I, like my sort of extrapolation of what I think it meant. You and have I'll two say young it. children. When are you doing all this? At night. Well, the only way I go to bed at night, okay. I can't Same. fall asleep unless I, uh, unless I'm reading. Yeah. Now I, I bought a Kindle last year because <laughs> I was, I had a book light. My wife's Same. like, dude, turn off that fucking light. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have a Kindle, which is great because I can just, you know, I'll have another idea for a yes. book and just add it to the Kindle, oh you know. God. I like the feel of turning the pages. I do too. Yeah. But at night I can't really, you know, yeah. 
I can't really like do it. So I'm going to ask you for those for those books before we. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked a lot about some of the things that you're doing at at Empath with facilitation, mm-hmm. mediation, the disc assessment, things like that. Are there things just in, in terms of being a creative to the audience here of restaurant operators? Like, are there are there things that you can think of that just you could talk about or recommend that immediately would have an impact for leaders on ways they can just help be have a more productive team, a better culture. I know that there's no simple solution yeah. to any of this, but even just sort of thought, you know, thought exercises. Or is it just higher empath? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it. the founder has to come to the table with a want, you know, like some of the the founder tips are like, have the founder have as few direct reports as possible. That usually is, you know, have, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you have a lot of direct reports? Too many, okay. way too many. I'm trying to solve that. You know, have really clear, I hate to say really clear job descriptions because then people go down the road, the like rabbit hole of like these extremely detailed so less job description so much as like roles and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Clear about what what lane, swim lanes, as my friend Jackie was an amazing HR consultant, if anybody needs anybody. But, you know, she calls them swim lanes. Like this is your... Yeah. And that can help. But it really... And this is the other thing I say, which I think is one of the things that makes it hard for me to market what I do is I don't know what the problems are until I get in. Yeah. Right. I can go in and be like, you're clearly communication is your issue. And then you get in there and it's like, no. We have too many fucking meetings. Like, yeah. I'm overwhelmed, right? Yeah. Also, sometimes you hear that, then you do a meeting audit, which is another thing I'll do, and they don't have that many meetings. Yeah. But there's a feeling like they're overwhelmed. So what's right? It's yeah. It's particular. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, like thing in the <laughs> <laughs> particular to the company. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever heard of the the A method of hiring? I started deploying this like a year ago, and it like changed so much of how I think about hiring, and it reminded me of that because basically, you know, the way you typically hire is, you know, here's the job description Mm -hmm. and let's go find people that have experience doing that. And then who feels the best and and that's who you hire. And the A method is, I mean, it's a, it's a couple of things. One, there's, there's a number of phases to it and there's a scorecard and then there's a bit of a weighted matrix to measure sort of the score as well as other things. But the most important thing is that the way that you look at the hire is not hiring for the role that you're hiring for, but what is the specific result that you're trying to achieve. Okay. And then you just have to find all of the questions that you would ask that would help you understand, could that person drive that result? So let's just say that it's a sales leader and you want to go from 4 million in revenue to 15 million. Yeah. That's their job. Like, that's what you're hiring for. Not are you, you know, like there's obviously all the soft skills and things that you have to, you have to hire for, but like, how do you solve for that? And how do you, you know, you know, prove that out. And then everything that you, that you ask is relative to that KPI. I'm a big believer in, you know, as a great leader, you have to, you have to have very clear KPIs. Yeah. Like, what does it mean to be successful, and how do you measure that? Yes. And because then you can know. We both. Are you have a the... fan of OKRs? Yeah. Yeah. I hate we... OKRs. Well, so here's the thing I'll say about OKRs, and I'm writing this whole piece on them because I've tried them a lot mm-hmm. in a lot of places. There's a very specific time and place for an OKR, Agreed. and most of the time, people are not ready. OKRs are a lot like going keto. It's like, if you go <laughs> keto, you either have to be 100% yes. yeah. uh, you know, on a keto diet because you can't be in between. Otherwise, no, otherwise you're hit, just eating heavy cream. Yeah, you're going to ask, yeah. you know, keto yeah. acidosis yes. and it's, it's, da- it's actually really dangerous. Yeah. You know, it's either you have to be like, I'm going to be 100% keto or yeah. not. OKRs are very similar. Sim- yes. And one, you have to be at a place of the business where you can very clearly define what is the objective. Yes. Because it's very dangerous if you define something and you actually don't, you, you're, you could pivot. Yes. At any minute. And that might be okay. And you don't want to, you know, prescribe something that's, you know, going to be somewhat waterfall. That you're, and obviously you have to have enough like systems in place and leadership that actually people can, you know, have a sort of a, you know, a top down. Yes. Most of the time it's failed, but you know, we've now tried, we're on our, on our third run at Mies and I did a bunch prior mm-hmm. at, you know, at other companies. And I find that the most important thing outside of like the number one thing is you have to choose the right objective. Yes. And that's basically everything. But how you prepare for how you'll actually operate as a company to manage the the, the process of OKRs is the most important thing outside of that is how are we going to culturally every day, every week, Correct. you know, relate to these. And not get distracted. And not get distracted. Yeah. But the beauty of them is it drives so much focus. Yes. You know, my team gets so excited once we, you know, we, we do it, you know, every 
six months now. Mm -hmm. So we don't do a quarterly one. We do it every, every six months and we sort of go into a hole for a while to plan it out and we'll do a SWOT analysis and then use that SWOT analysis to understand like, okay, of the, you know, we'll do a stack ranking of like, what are the most important strengths or weaknesses or opportunities? And then from that, we will sort of decide what is the, okay, what is our objective for the next six months? And the great thing about it is that everybody knows yeah. this is what we're doing. But more importantly, we're not doing anything else except that. But that's the that's where people fail, I think. They're like, well, this is what we're doing, but we also have to do all these other things. And it just, it's like scope creep. And it, exactly. And that's, yeah, that's where it always fails. And if you don't have some agreement and process of how you're going to make sure that that mm. doesn't happen. I think that comes from the founder. Yeah. 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 And Or the CEO, I should say. I Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. And it, you know, so I, I mean, like most founders, I'm always thinking, I always have ideas, yep. I always have things I want to, but now I've, I've had to create systems for the team knowing to call me out and say, yeah. hey, wait a second, that's not, that's not part of it. Yeah. And, but I do more now as I sort of, I have a sort of on the side, I have 20% of my work that is future thinking things. Yep. Cause that's the other danger of OKRs is OKRs are great, but they can't be the only thing at all times, because if someone isn't thinking about five years from now, sure, especially in technology, you're, yeah. you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be able to survive. I love them, but they are incredibly difficult yes. to do well. Sometimes it's like, a lot of discipline. yeah, it's yeah. like there is this sort of question, is the juice worth a squeeze? Because it's yeah. so much work for, them. but I think if you get it right, it's good. But most of the time it's not. No. So you mentioned a whole bunch of books. You mentioned mm. a couple, like a couple frameworks. Is there, before we move on, because I want to ask you about women in oh, hospitality, because yeah. I don't, I couldn't find any information on it. I did time, actually. Okay. I mean, I went to the website, <laughs> yeah. I saw, but yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to learn a bit well, more. Well, there's a reason for that, which I'll tell you. But. Okay. <laughs> before we end yeah. on, like, just, so I get, I get the, the premise of empath and you're helping, I mean, not just restaurants, but generally, you know, mostly restaurants and, and, and generally like leadership teams. How can, like, how, how can people learn more and... And who would be an ideal kind of candidate mm. to reach out to to learn more about Empath? To date, my sweet spot has been either founder, like multiple founder-led organizations. So people who like came together because they had something in common, an idea. And then, you know, as so often happens, they're like, oh, I didn't know this about you, whatever. So helping them sort of navigate the conflict and move forward or not move forward, depending but in general, companies, small to mid-sized companies that are scaling. So, you know, it depends on what scale means to that company. Obviously, if you're Italy, going from one Italy to two is like another restaurant going from five to 20. I've always worked at companies, Tacombi, Dig, Italy, that were in that process. And what you see is as companies grow, particularly companies that are New York based and moving out of New York, although I assume it's the same if you start in Chicago, is that you if it's founder led, the founder can walk to every location and then one day they've got a place in Miami. And so how do you keep that culture? How do you keep that connection when you've expanded outside of a place that you can walk to all of them? Yeah. So, you know, the answer is well-intentioned founder CEOs or just CEOs or anybody high up who says we can be better. I can see that we're trying to do this. It's not translating. What's wrong? Where's the conflict? Where's the rub? How yeah. can we fix it? I love that you're sort of thinking about how do you scale as yeah. an organization when... Well, that's where culture, that's where culture gets in danger. If, you know, if the five of us are just sitting in a room, like the culture is pretty healthy, even if you have a couple restaurants or a couple businesses you can walk to. But as soon as you start spreading out, I'm, you know, I'm impressed that you do it sort of virtually. It's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. When I think about it as it relates to food, we have, there's very similar challenges when you're trying to scale the vision of your food, in addition to the vision of your business, yes. I see there's a lot of parallels because, you know, when you start to scale, often restaurants will simplify, dumb down, yes. you know, cookie cutter type things right. because it's easier. Because yep. the easier thing to do is to, is to just remove some of the, you know, the things that, that were really... The nuance that made it... Yeah. Yes. And, and that nuance is actually what made yes. you really special. And the great you know, businesses are the ones that figure out how to scale that nuance, yes. you know, and it's so hard, you know, but when you I, do it yeah. right, it's such a, it's funny. I just posted this thing from this investor, Bill Ackman, very famous hedge fund investor. And he's uh, one of the majority investors in a bunch of restaurants, RBI group and Chipotle. And, you know, he said something really poignant that I was like, wow, that's, that's really smart. Mm -hmm. That, that the biggest moat mm -hmm. in defensibility of a business in, in, in the restaurant space is if you have scale 
and you've been able to scale the you know the quality the of, specialness yeah yeah because t- i mean you can i won't call out one of the re- mm-hmm. I mean, there are restaurants that have a thousand locations and you know it's not the same as it was when it was one and the same thing is with culture you know it's it's really really hard yes and i i mean to a certain extent i i blame some venture capitalists for that right they invest they want their money back they want to sell and so the whoever came up with the idea is now forced to grow 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 right mm-hmm. you dilute the brand as you expand yeah well, that's why you're here. Okay, so Women in Hospitality United. Yes. Did you start this thing? So, you know, in keeping with the sort of people-focused, restorative justice, whatever, in 2018, when I was working for Mario, who I worked for for 11 years, yeah, and, you know, the shit hit the fan, and it became very evident that he had assaulted, well, at the time, actually, I didn't know that uh, that it was full-fledged assault, but and I thought, God, you know, I've been working for this guy 11 years. And I wouldn't say the whole time, but in the last five years, my corporate role, I worked pretty closely with him. And I thought, you know, was I a victim? Was I was I a, an aide to a perpetrator? Did Being a woman so close to somebody who was behaving this way, did it, did it make other people feel like, oh, he must be safe and sort of allow him to? And I just, I was like, I can't be the only one who feels this way. So I sent out an email. At the time, Time's Up was a big thing in Hollywood. And I said, what does Time's Up look like for women in hospitality? And about 45 of us got together at Haven's Kitchen and it was kind of a shit show, right? Like you had people in there who were like, oh my God, I remember hearing about this, the (laughs) Haven's Kitchen. Yeah. And some people were like, I've hung out with Mario a thousand times. If you don't know how to like avoid being grabbed, that's your problem. And some people were like, I'm really fucking traumatized because my entire life has been crying in the walk-in because somebody, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And at the time I was like, well, that was, whoa. And a friend of mine said, let's just do a couple more and see. And so we we honed in. And I think the second one, we tried to bring some good intent, some well-intentioned men into the mix. And the, the verdict from that was like, no, 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 not yet. <laughs> and then after that, it was like, it developed some themes. And we did, you know. It Those was, poor guys. <laughs> they were great, but it just was like, we were like, you, you know, you don't belong yet. Yeah. Which is goes back to Priya Parker and sort of having an idea of what... And then a lot of a it's lot so of funny. Was, Carrie Diamond recommended the same book. Oh yeah, that makes sense. What, did, what was it called? The Art of Gathering. The Art of Gathering. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I mean, she just that makes sense, yeah. right? And a lot of it was facilitation, like throwing a bunch of post its up at the wall and sort of getting what people thought were was an issue in the industry. Anyway, after like four or five of these meetings, I was like, okay. Oh, actually, we said we're going to do a, a solution sprint, which is yeah, I'm sure you know what like a design sprint mm-hmm. or whatever. But we're going to sort of we're going to pull the community, ask them for what they think the problems are, assemble teams around it, and then hack those problems, you know? Mm-hmm. And everybody said, great. And what about the organization? And I was like, what organization? Well, like women in hospitality, this group that's been meeting over and over again. So we sort of accidentally, my co-founder, Liz Murray, and, and originally Aaron Fairbanks, who has moved on sort of out of hospitality, but we ended up founding a nonprofit. And so we did, we did a listening tour. We did a lot of meetups, sort of spaces to facilitate conversation. We did another series of sprints. And then the pandemic happened. And I think some of us were willing to throw in the towel, just, you know. And Liz actually said, you know what? Nobody's doing anything right now. Let's just give it a minute. And during the pandemic, as had it happened before, but more than ever, all these other women's organizations in the space were reaching out. JBF, James Beard Foundation, LADAM, you know, Chad project. Like it just was incredible. And they were like, how do we do this so that we're not duplicating work? So we're not mm-hmm. siloed, but we're not cannibalizing. Yeah. Like, why am I working on a mentorship program when James Beard has mentorship on lock? And so from there we created, which is which is launching this year, more coalition, movement to organize restaurant equity, founded by James Beard Foundation, regarding her, which is an organization yep. out of LA, and women in hospitality, which will now be the founding, will be more women in hospitality was born of an idea of gathering all these things together. And so now we don't need us anymore. Our first members include Chad, Drive Change, you know, sort of for the workforce development mm-hmm. part, Southern Smoke. It's It's been pretty incredible. And and the idea is, as long as you are working to make a more sustainable and not in the like, you know, green. Yeah, I got you. But, you know, an industry that works for everybody, it doesn't matter sort of how you're doing it. It's based on the model of ACT UP, which was to deal with the AIDS crisis and if your MO was to handcuff yourself to the building and that was working to solve the AIDS crisis or yours was to go to Washington and advocate for policy, as long as we're all working towards the same thing, it's a, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats. Mm-hmm. 
So part of the reason you can't probably can't find it is it's, it's really morphing into this other thing that is going to be a coalition of organizations. That's great. And is yeah. it like a, it, will it become like a, a parent company of a bunch of these things? It itself will just serve to bring these organizations together and move towards, right? Sharing resources, right? That's the other thing is you're like, I can't believe so-and-so is doing that. I had no idea. I wouldn't have spent all this time or or geographically speaking, like somebody's yeah. doing something really well in New York. Well, who's doing it in Texas where they need that same thing and sort of how you how we can all unsilo. Cool. Yeah. I love that. Well, we're going to move on from that <laughs> because I asked you <laughs> cool. something before that I said I was just very curious about, which was prepping for a TED Talk, which you did. I don't know when that TED Talk was. It was how many years ago? 2010, maybe? Okay, yeah. so, you know. 2011? 14 yeah. years ago? Yes. 13 years ago. How did you come about doing yes. a TED Talk and how did you prep for it? Yeah. And how did it, like, how did it feel? What, what did it feel to, to do a TED Talk? Well, I didn't know, I don't know if TED was a big thing back then, but I definitely had no idea what I was getting into. I just, it was seemed like a bunch of keynote speakers and like, I don't know, I, they were like, you have 10 minutes. And then I got there and like real legit people were, and I was like, eh. John Frazier was tapped to be the speaker because Meatless Monday was one of the sponsors and they were interested in just sort of at least representing that part. And he had to drop out. He, I don't, I tell everybody this story. I've never, I don't think I've actually met him. I'm like, thank you, John Fraser, wherever you are, if I ever <laughs> meet you. And they, so they called me, they called Mario and Mario was like, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. And I had, <laughs> just no, offered you yeah, <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. I put together like literally a bunch of PowerPoint slides, white background with like boxes and text. And like, I mean, if you've seen it, I end with a picture of my dog. Cause I was like, she's listened to me practice this whole time. And it's funny because the the person running it after it was all over said, when I got your slides, I was like, fuck, we've really, we messed up. But oh, she said that yes, to you? Yes, yeah, yeah. She was like, Good for her. she <laughs> was like, I mean, the slides were literally like yeah. a 13-year-old that made them. I, yeah. didn't, I was yeah. youngish in my career. I really didn't know what I was getting into. People had like animation. One of the guys was a doctor. Like yeah. it was, and, I, and I, I think I was just too naive to know. I don't think I even really registered. But I, I think the personality and sort of the vulnerability and authenticity uh -huh. carried it through and it was a success. But to this day, I haven't watched it. I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Oh my on, gosh. I used to say on an answering machine. We don't say that anymore. Yeah. Nobody knows what that is. Yeah. That's so funny. You know, I, I actually just remembered I had a similar thing happen to me. I used to own this these restaurants called Bark, Bark Hot Dogs. Mm -hmm. There was in Brooklyn yeah. in a minute. And we catered this event called the Brooklyn Tech something. Mm -hmm. I forget what it was. And it was like 300 some odd people in this, like someplace in Brooklyn and we cater the thing. And they said, oh, can you come talk about starting a business in, in Brooklyn as well as part of the event? Mm -hmm. It's like, sure. And so we like, I was actually cooking the food, you know, in the restaurant and then came there and I was like, I'll just come up and, and talk. Off and, the cuff, yeah. and they're like, here, you know, you stand, you, you know, come here, you'll be, you'll be next. And I was like, who's, who's talking? And the 300 some odd people, it was more than, I was like, mm -hmm. it, was, it was at least 300, you know, some odd people in this, in this room. And Jonathan Ives was <laughs> talking. <laughs> exactly. The like the you know the lead designer of Apple mm -hmm. was there talking about design and UX. Thank God I didn't even know what it, I couldn't I didn't it didn't register until right as I was as he was done because I wasn't really paying attention. I was sure. like, talking to my team, and then he was finishing up, and he's like, "Thank you very much." And there was all these questions, and then I got up there. I had nothing. Yeah, I was just gonna talk. So I got up there, and I was like. Jonathan Ives, yeah. huh? <laughs> yeah. Let's give it up for Jonathan Ives. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I ended up just sort of just talking, telling my story and, and it was fine. And because it was so different from what, from yes. what they had, but sometimes it's better to not be prepared. Yeah. I think I would have been way, I mean, I was nervous, but I, that's just because it was public speaking. But I think if I had realized what I was actually getting into, it, it probably, probably would have, I don't know if I would tanked, but it would have been really stressful. Yeah. Well, I hope you do another TED talk. Well, are they still a thing? Do people still do them? Yeah, okay. I think so. I, I just saw, I mean, I, I don't know, I think it was last year, Godara did a, a okay. talk. So, yeah, I think so. Okay. How <laughs> are you different today from oh. five years ago? I think about this a lot because I'm, I always, I had this other premise. It's like on my wall mm -hmm. as well. I have a lot of things in my office mm -hmm. just as reminders. And if I'm not embarrassed by things that I did five years ago, then I feel like I haven't grown enough. Yes. I'm curious how you feel like you've changed or grown. Well, it's funny because as we talked about before, there, there was, I knew something about you that I had already decided that that was a person however many years ago, which you can cut out if you want. But <laughs> I feel very strongly that if we hold people accountable for the person, you know, 
people will call me for a reference for somebody that worked at Italy. I'm like, I haven't worked with that person in 15 years. Yeah. If they are still that same person, like it, it would not be fair for me to make any, unless they were exceptional at the time. But yeah. some of us were immature. I mean, five years, geez. Are there tangible things that are you know, objectively different about you today than five years ago? I mean, how deep do you want to go? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I work a lot on... I'm what my therapist would call hypervigilant. I'm constantly assessing and, and gathering data, which actually makes me very good at what I do. But I'm I'm constantly assessing, like, am I safe or not? And and as you, I'm sure you know from, sounds like from your reading, like the amygdala hijacks you and then all of a sudden you're, and so I'm really, and I, I have that response to things that now I say to myself, are you unsafe? No, somebody might be mad at you. Doesn't mean you're unsafe, right? So really a lot of like work on on just, Instead of being a little bit paranoid and hypervigilant, and then and then that's a little bit where the mediation. I do a little bit of triangulation, like, well, maybe Emily knows if Josh is mad at me, so I'll just check in with Emily. I'm, like, it's a very it's it's not intentional, but it's very strategic. And so I've really worked on like, why are you asking Emily that question, or why is your brain telling you that you're in danger? And yeah, we suffer far more in imagination than in reality. Yes, <laughs> yes. But your body responds to that imagination anyway. And so I'm sure you've like, there's a lot of somatic responses that happen mm -hmm. that convince me that like, and and so I really work a lot on like. What do you think that comes from? That that feeling of me? I don't know. I'm, we can ask my therapist. I think, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm Come sure there's a, there's a combination of a bunch yes. of things. I have a similar, a similar, more like, you know, I'm constantly thinking that everything will crumble. Yep. I have a feeling it's probably because my childhood, my father passed away when I was very young. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, 20 some odd years ago, but, yeah. but, um, you know, if we're trying to process why, yes. why we do these things and catastrophizing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it is that thing of like, oh yeah, things are not right. And yes. I need to find out why. And it's so hard to say, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that being said also, and I joke about this with some of my friends, a lot of us got into hospitality to like get drunk and make bad decisions. Like I've, you know, I've definitely like you said, done some things that I'm either embarrassed about, whatever. I think I certainly still make mistakes, but some of the more egregious sort of embarrassing things I think are behind me. That's good. Yeah. I hope the same. I hope the same. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like it. This is great. Yeah. This is lovely. Thank you Except so much. for the much. microphone, it felt like we were just having a chat. Yeah, yeah. I know. You know what? I love hearing that. We hear yeah. that more often. That's hopefully the point, though. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning into the Mies Podcast. The music from the show is a remix of the song Art Mirror by an old friend, hip-hop artist, Fresh Daily. For show notes and more, visit getmes.com forward slash podcast. That's G-E-T-M-E-Z dot -E com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you can share it with fellow entrepreneurs and culinary pros and give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Keep innovating. Don't settle. Make today a little bit better than yesterday. And remember, it's impossible for us to learn what we think we already know. See you next time.